You're here with Rick and Steve, and welcome to another episode of Rock Shovels and Manuscripts. Steve, where are we going today? We're going to step outside of the Holy Land to Turkey. Okay. I was amazed that when I took my trip to Turkey, I was just as inspired and felt close to God as I did in Israel. Because so much happened in the biblical record mm -hmm. outside the land of Israel where the apostles traveled. Mm -hmm. So I got to visit several of the cities that the Apostle Paul went to. And we're going to visit some of those and just see some of the interesting sites in Turkey. Excellent. Let's go. All right. Well, I want to start off with a passage of Scripture. This comes from Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up! Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, Steve, I got to tell you, as a student of the Bible and having been a pastor, preacher like you mm -hmm. as well, I'd love to dig into that passage because it sounds like you could really exegete it and make it very much come alive. I have found that the uh, letters to the seven churches are just chock full mm. of data, not in the sense of heady knowledge, but in the sense of, hey, straighten up your walk. Mm -hmm walk with God right. Mm -hmm. I wanted to read this passage of scripture though, because we're talking about Sardis. That's where we're going first in Turkey. Okay. And I've got this cool picture I'd like to share. What you're looking at now is the gymnasium of Sardis. But to call it a gymnasium doesn't work because today a gym is where you go to work out. And they definitely did that there. Okay. This is more of a community center, a school, um, a gymnasium, a bathhouse. This is where the community of Sardis hung out. And what's really cool about it, and I'll show it to you in a moment, I don't wanna show it to you just yet, but right next to this is the synagogue. But before we move over to the synagogue, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about Sardis. Uh, in this time frame, Sardis was about 25% Jewish. So that means a quarter to even a third of the population in Sardis was Jewish. Wow. They were on the city council, they had significant influence and respect in this town. And you don't expect that outside of Israel. No, I wouldn't have expected it at all. So here we have a community of roughly 25, 30% Jewish. We've got this huge gymnasium community center right next door to the synagogue. By the way, the synagogue, which we can take a look at, is the largest excavated synagogue in the world, or at least one of the largest. So here we have a community, it's 25, 30% Jewish, right next door to the gymnasium, and the biggest synagogue that we've ever found, pretty much, is right next door. Wow. Now this synagogue, and we're gonna look at a close-up well, in a minute. That is huge, Steve. Yeah, I'm standing at the back end. You can see, well, maybe we'll call it the entrance. What you see in front of you, next to that doorway, are two pillared, recessed areas. We're gonna zoom in on those in just a moment. Uh, but before we do, there's something else that I want to tell you about this synagogue. Right out front is a plaza, and in the plaza was the public fountain. Now, in our country, you want water, you go to the water fountain. Mm -hmm. One in your house, one in your bathroom, there's one at the gas station, they're everywhere. In those days, there was one city water supply. Everybody went and got their water from it, and this was on synagogue property. Oh. The Jewish community provided the water the entire town. Wow. Talk about a place of prestige, honor, and respect. Hmm. And it was right next to the gymnasium. So you have a house of worship to the God of Israel right next door to the pantheon, as it were, of the phony gods. So I said we were going to zoom in a little bit. I'd like to do that now. What we're looking at here is probably one side um, would have been where the Torah scroll was kept. And on the other side, maybe a seat of honor, maybe a place where the 
uh, Moses' seat was, maybe where the reader was in. We can zoom in a little more just so you can see that uh, Torah section right there. Now, this is where they would have kept the Torah scroll. Yeah. Okay. So this is what today we would call the Ark. Okay. It's not definitive, but this is the likely and possible location okay. of, the, of the Ark. I suppose um, our, our viewers may not know this, but in a modern synagogue, you have your seats. In front of you is a stage or a raised area, which we call the bima. And then on the bima are always a couple of things. One is a cabinet with curtains on it. Behind the curtains are the Torah scrolls. That cabinet is called the Ark. And the cur curtains are closed as a matter of course. They're opened at times, closed at times. And also a light over the Ark called the Ner Tamid, which is a light that never goes out. It's the eternal light. Mm -hmm. So you can see the uh, similarity, yes. the throwback to the ancient temple. Yes. Now, I, I know that the Torah scroll obviously was read in the synagogue <laughs> service. But it also being a reminder of the covenant that the Jewish people have with God, was that part of the reason it was important to have the Torah scroll present? The Torah scroll is definitely a reminder of God's covenant, but it's not a reminder. It is the covenant. Mm. So it's almost like every generation, every house of worship, every gathering of Jewish people have the covenant that God made with our people. And it's honored. It's respected. Sometimes it's kissed. Mm. It's given when the curtains are open, the congregation rises. Prayers are said to sanctify the heart, the synagogue, before the scrolls are opened. And when the scrolls are opened, the inside's never touched. A little metal pointer is used. And so some of these scrolls last hundreds and hundreds of years because they're handled with such respect and reverence. And then when the Torah scroll gets worn out and can't be used anymore, it's not thrown away. It's buried. It's put in what now is called the Geniza, mm. but it's buried with respect and honor because we respect God's word to that extent. Wow. If you were to drop a prayer book in the synagogue, a traditional Jewish person would pick it up and kiss it. So can you imagine my discomfort visiting a local church? And maybe the projector isn't high enough for the movie, so they grab the closest book and shove it right mm -hmm. under the projector. It might be a Bible. Mm -hmm. A guy takes his Bible, puts it down on the floor, has a cup of coffee. To this day, I'll walk by, I'll pick up the Bible, and I'll put it back in his hand. <laughs> so my guess is a Torah scroll is never thrown down on the ground. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's handled with utmost reverence. This Torah location, this ark, has special significance to me. On my tour through Turkey, I was with a group of students, and I was the only Jewish person on the tour group. I know that Turkey is a predominantly Muslim country. It was my first time being in a Muslim country. I was uncomfortable, to say the least. What if they find out I'm Jewish? Will they hurt me? Should I even be here? Is it safe? I didn't know. And they're valid questions. They are valid questions. I just knew I was uncomfortable. And I told people, hey, you don't need to tell anybody about my background. You know, nobody needs to know why I raise issues. So... I'm from Tucson, Arizona. Everybody knows it's dry and hot there. This is summertime. I'm in short pants and short sleeve shirts, but it's probably around 60 degrees. It's starting to drizzle. I brought some of those pants that you can yes. zip up. Mm -hmm. I'm freezing. I, my fingers are shaking. I'm trying to zip up the pants. It's starting to rain. I ditch the group and I head for the nearest cover. The nearest cover was that Torah arc. <laughs> Really? So I jump up under there, and I'm up under there with some other people, including a guy who's obviously Turkish, which means he's almost certainly Muslim, since I think it's 101% Muslim there. 101%, okay. <laughs> I'm exaggerating by maybe 3 or 4%, okay? okay? all right. <laughs> so I'm shaking, trying to pull on my pants. This man reaches over, grabs my pants, and zips them on for me. In our culture... You don't touch another man unless he's dying, and even then you need yeah. his permission. In their culture, it's quite different. So he helps me get my pants on. I thank him. He smiles. I smile. I really appreciate it. I go a little later. I'm not the tour leader. I'm in the tour. The tour guide, he just chuckles. He said, when's the last time you've seen a Jew and a Muslim in a Torah closet together? <laughs> <laughs> 
helping one another exactly. put on a pair of pants. Exactly. <laughs> it's like the beginning of a joke. <laughs> but now, on a positive note, the culture of Turkey, let me tell you some things I learned while I was there. Okay. okay. I spent some time hanging out with the bus driver and the tour guide. Okay, we had two tour guides. We had the one that came from the States who did most of the teaching. And we actually had the president of the tour association on the bus with us. Of all the tour guides, he was the head tour guide. He was there. And the bus driver, who was the head of all the bus drivers, had nothing but the best on this tour. Well, the group was going off to do a hike in the rain, and I'm like, have fun. I'm going to hang out with the bus driver and the tour guide. We went to a local, I don't know what they call them there, but the guys, they sit around and they drink tea. We were at that place. So we'll call it in Arabic, Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> it was not a Starbucks, but it was a local place to get coffee and tea. So the three of us are sitting down, drinking tea, getting to know one another, breaking off the rust, building a relationship. By the way, by the time I left Turkey, I was embraced and kissed by these men. Oh. The culture there, they still greet one another with a holy kiss. Mm -hmm. Men can walk with their arms around each other. Yes. It's, it's a different culture there. Yes. But while I'm learning these guys and getting to know them, they're telling me about Turkey and the hospitable culture of Turkey. Now remember, I'm a Jewish guy there. I have negative thoughts about Muslims. I'm not saying that was good and right. I'm just telling you how it was. And these guys are welcoming, welcoming me into their society. They're hugging on me. They're kissing on me. And he says, let me tell you about Turkey. You're with a tour, so things are different. But let's say you are here alone. Every village in Turkey has a guest house. They would put you up for free. They would insist, and they would feed you. Every village in Turkey. You could go from one end of this country to the other and never pay for your food or your lodging. That is amazing. So I think back to the biblical example of hospitality that Abraham showed, that elders are supposed to have, that in Hebrews it says, don't forget to be hospitable to strangers because by this some have entertained angels. And I'm learning this message from Muslims. My worldview changed that day. I bet it did. All of this in Sardis. <laughs> well, there was something else in Sardis. I've got a picture of the remains of the Temple of Artemis, or Diana. This is one of the seven largest temples in the world, the Greek temples. This one here is twice the size of the Parthenon just to give you an idea of scope and size. It's amazing how tall are those pillars? Yeah, they're extremely tall. Um, I'm guessing 50, 60 feet. Yeah. I mean, they're way up there. Mm -hmm. Originally, they might have been 100 feet. I mean, it was huge. Um, Artemis was the goddess of the hunt, the woods, and childbirth. So here wow. we have, in one location of the city, a synagogue. The God of Israel is worshipped. Right next door, the Greco-Roman gymnasium. Oh. And then just down the street, the Temple to Artemis. Okay, we're going to pause right there, but don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Rock Shovels and Manuscripts. We're talking about some very cool things, and we're in Turkey right now. We are in Turkey. Okay, where are we going next? We're heading over to Laodicea. Okay. Let me read to you again from the book of Revelation. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I'm rich, I've acquired wealth, don't need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke in discipline. So be earnest and repent. What a great and rich passage of scripture. Okay, walk us through some of this. What I wanna share with you is how a passage of scripture can come alive through archeology, span okay? It talks about you are neither cold nor hot, I wish you were one or the other, but because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Okay. And this is Laodicea, okay? Laodicea is nasty, lukewarm water that I wanna spit out of my mouth. You're neither hot water nor cold water. For now, we'll say you're neither a cup of tea nor a soda. 
you just nasty, tepid water that I don't even want to have in my mouth anymore. Well, the thing about Laodicea, we've learned, is they were known and mocked for having nasty water. Really? Really. In fact, they dug up some of the water pipes, and the water pipes are calcified. I have a picture of one right here. Okay. Oh, my goodness. So you can see oh. <laughs> how nasty the water must have been to, to do that to the pipes. I thought the water was bad in Texas. <laughs> this is much worse. Much worse. And you can see many of these. The whole system of water pipes are just gummed up with calcification. They had to pipe water in from miles away. And by the time it got there, it was lukewarm. Oh. And it wasn't really worth drinking. It was nasty. If that was enough to learn to make the scriptures richer, that would be enough. But there's so much more. What I want to do is I'm going to turn and face the horizon and show you a photograph. Take a look. Okay. What do you see, Rick? Well, what? first off, that is absolutely beautiful. What, <laughs> what is the white in the background? That's what I want to talk to you about. It looks like snow, doesn't it? Yes, it does. But it's not. It's not snow at all. What you're seeing there is calcification. You're seeing the deposits from hard water. Really? The next photo will show a close-up oh of what you're looking at. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. Yeah, that's not ice. It looks like ice. Yep, <laughs> but it's not. It's a hot day. This stuff is, I don't know what you call it, you know, lime, lime, I don't know. It's just, it's gooky water, hard stuff left mm -hmm. behind, the salts of the water. There are tons of hot springs there. Let me show you one more photo. You can actually wade through some of this area. That is the water absolute. is hot. It's, it's, it's like a, a turkey version of the Dead Sea. People go there for therapeutic reasons, soaking in the hot springs, which is very salty, like mm -hmm. the Dead Sea. It's a, it's a huge resort even to this day. It was a resort in the days of the Apostle Paul also. Okay. People would go there, wounded soldiers, mm -hmm. people on vacation to soak in these warm, beautiful waters. These are hot waters. Now, if you were to face this, you'd see the white of Hierapolis. This is called Hierapolis. You turn around, heading towards Colossae, and let me show you what you'd see there. Okay. What do you see? Wow, beautiful mountains and fields. That's just gorgeous. And this is the, the, the interesting thing from a guy from Tucson. You look in one direction and you see the hot springs of mm -hmm. Hierapolis. You turn around and you see a mountain. But this mountain has clouds over it all the time. Mm -hmm. It's a wet mountain. Mm -hmm. Water's pouring down on it all the time. And streams run off the mountain. Wow. So uh, my tour guide, he walked me over to a stream. This was in a, a nearby location. And in the entire tour group, he said, Steve, what do you see? He picked on me because he knew I was from Tucson, a desert. We don't have running water in Tucson. <laughs> <laughs> and my response was, I see a lot of water. Mm -hmm. And some of the people chuckled because this was water you could actually step over. It wasn't a lot of water <laughs> by their standards, but by my standards, wow, look at all the water. <laughs> <laughs> and he wanted to make the point, yes, this is the source of the cold springs mm -hmm. up in the mountains. Behind us are the hot springs of Hierapolis. The hot springs are therapeutic. They're good for the body. The cold springs are good for the fields and for drinking. But Laodicea was stuck in the middle. It was neither hot nor cold. Oh, what an illustration. It was good for nothing but to be spat out of the mouth. So when Yeshua spoke to these seven churches in the book of Revelation, he spoke to their contemporary situation, mm -hmm. things they would have understood, and he used that to teach them a lesson. I've got another photo of Hierapolis that I'd like to share. One of the things they discovered in the necropolis of Hierapolis, that is the, the burial place, is for years, they thought might be the burial place of Philip the Evangelist. Huh. And shortly after I went there, it was determined that, yes, indeed, this has been verified to as much as archaeologists mm -hmm. can verify yeah. this type of thing. This is where Philip the Evangelist died and was buried. And so in Hierapolis, we've got the burial place of Philip the Evangelist. That's an outline of it, but we jump to another photo see if I can pull that up for you, as we're walking into the area, you notice there's a little symbol over the archway yes, there? Let's zoom yes. in and take a look at that. Mm -hmm. There's a little cross. It's yes. an ancient anchor cross, I think. Mm -hmm. It's hard to look at to, to identify. Yep, this is the place 
where the Philip the Evangelist was buried. Not that exact location, but that general area. Yes. So we start off in Turkey, and we look at these pagan shrines. We move over to a city with believers in it. But Yeshua has a problem with them. They are believers, but they're not walking like believers should walk. In fact, as you look at the seven congregations, for most of them, he has rebuke for. In fact, he says, I love you. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm rebuking you. We get to Sardis. We get to this area of Laodicea. And we see that the rebuke ties into the culture of the place. Mm -hmm. And we'll see that time and again with the seven churches. Some of them, we know how the rebuke ties to the culture. Some of them, we don't. Some of them, it's not so much the rebuke, but where he manifests himself and says, you know, thus says the one with the feet made of bronze and the hair on fire and things like that. Well, there happened to be a bronze foundry there. <laughs> that type of thing. <laughs> well, I mean, if, if you didn't know something about the archaeology in the area, what they've uncovered, what they've learned about the place, you wouldn't nearly know as much about these letters to the seven churches. Exactly. And it's not like we have to have them. Right but they make it so much richer, right? so much thicker. Okay, you have the steak. Well, now we've got the steak sauce and the potato and the sour cream, and, you know. Right, in the same way we know about tepid water is not the most enjoyable to drink. Right, we get it. So we get that already. Yeah. But when you know it's tied into that very area he's talking about, you know that he's driving the point home using an illustration they would have gotten immediately. Yep. I got another couple of aha moments at another location we went to called Pergamum. You've heard of Pergamum? Yes. Also one of the seven churches. Let me read to you what the scripture says about Pergamum. Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. So obviously, this is another one of those passages just deep with meaning, so give us a few nuggets out of this. All right. There's a white stone tied in here. There's a double-edged sword tied in here. Mm -hmm. And there's some other things, but those are the two that I want to draw everybody's attention to. Great. First, he says, to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write, these are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. Later on, again, it says, that I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Mm -hmm. Pergamum was a major city and a seat of government. And the law of Pergamum was, and the word is dus gladiae. A gladius was the sword, deuce was double-sided, okay? So they had the law of the sword there. The rule was that only the government of Pergamum had the right to execute with the sword. Are you kidding me? And so the fact that he ties the double-edged sword <laughs> to this rebuke, ah, the history of Pergamum that we have, the law of the sword comes from here, I get it. I, I need a moment to think about this. I mean, I, I did not know that. That is really, really cool. Isn't that cool? Yeah, well, it changes the scripture. It gives it deeper meaning where you, you're getting it. You're understanding this. It's like if a pastor from another town comes to a church, say, in Odessa or Midland, Texas, okay. and he talks a lot about football and a lot about oil wells and maybe a little bit about cowboys. Well, he's communicating with them on a level that they understand, Absolutely. can appreciate, and respect. Yes. And that's exactly what Yeshua did. Yes. But in Pergamum, there were so many tie-ins. That was one of them. Another one, the seed of Satan, where Satan dwells. It was mentioned twice. 
Now, archaeologists are trying to determine exactly what that means, but there's a couple of contenders. There was a statue to Caesar there and a temple to Caesar there. Mm. So is Caesar the Satan? There's also a temple of Zeus there. Mm. Is Zeus the seat of Satan? Nobody's for sure, but it's mentioned twice. So people are still trying to figure out and get to the bottom of that story. What is the seat of Satan? And either one of those really would still fit the story and fit ex the example of, and the admonition of what the Lord was trying to say. Without a doubt. So we've got the seat of Satan. We've got the gladius sword. We've got a white stone. Now, the white stone is the one that makes me the most excited. So I want to talk to you about the white stone for a minute. And it may not be the one that they're talking about, but it is a white stone of extreme biblical significance. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about it, but I want to wait for just a couple of minutes and let the tension build and the anticipation and the excitement. Are you like, where's he going with that? <laughs> <laughs> I can just tell you, I don't want to wait at okay. all. <laughs> well, there's one thing left before we run out of time that I have to share with you. Okay. It's really exciting. Ha happened at Pergamum. Let me read a passage of scripture, okay. and then I'll tie it in for you. I'm in Acts 17, 22 and 23. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Now what you worship is something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. In Pergamum, they found an altar to the unknown God. No way. And I've got a picture of it. Are you kidding? Let's see it. <laughs> they translated it, and this is the exact type of altar that Paul was talking about. No way. The inscription to the unknown God. Amazing. So every little bit of scripture, we have to really take our time, go through it slowly and understand there's probably more to it. Definitely. <laughs> well, we hope you enjoyed this episode of Rock Shovels and Manuscripts. We'll see you next week. This episode was produced by and for God's Learning Channel. If you're enjoying this series, your financial support will help us keep this program on the air. Simply send your contribution to God's Learning Channel, P.O. Box 61000, Midland, Texas 79711-1000. Or log on to our website at www.glc.us.com and donate using PayPal. Please be sure to designate which program your contribution is intended to support. Thank you for helping us make unique quality programming a reality. Order your copy of this program from the GLC Bookstore by calling the numbers or visiting the website on your screen. Please include the program number when ordering.